we approached the city about building a dock at Mayport. And the dock is almost complete. It's a $6 million dock. And it's an amazing structure in a lot of ways. And we'll talk a little bit about when the OSERT ship will, will get there. Um, we hope it'll be finished by the end of the year. And then we'll see where it goes from there. Then we were also able, again, through some work with um, Chris Fisher, who I'll introduce in a second, um, we managed to get the le legislature to allocate some money to OSEARCH at JU to build a, what effectively is the world headquarters for OSEARCH at Mayport. Uh, got a $5 million grant to do that, and we're in the midst of getting started on that. Uh, with a little effort, uh, we hope to start construction in June of 24, and then finish by December of 25. So just sort of thinking about where things are headed. Uh, joining me on the panel this afternoon is, I want to say, former councilman, also former mayor of Atlantic Beach, um, William B. Bill Gulliford. Thank you. Um, who is a longtime friend of um, JU, OSEARCH, and uh, the Jacksonville community, Jacksonville Beach community. Also with us is Chris Fisher, who is the founder of OSEARCH the largest shark tracking organization in the world. Uh, we're excited that he is explorer in residence at JU, uh, comes to campus periodically and lectures to our students and talks. Um, we literally talk weekly, if not more frequently than that, text constantly. Um, and so it's, it's an exciting partnership. Um, we have had a number of students on OSEARCH vessels doing research. COVID sort of put up damper on some of that but we've, we're beginning to get back, and we hope to have an expedition here off the southeast um, in November. And so we're going to see how this all works out. Um, let me introduce um, Councilman Gulliford and ask him the first question, and that is a little bit about uh, what gave you the idea of asking JU and OSEARCH to undertake establishing a facility at Mayport? Does this work? Yeah. Uh, this guy right here. I happen to hear him speak, and... Um, and heard, like a little closer. Okay, heard a little bit about OSEARCH, heard him speak, and I thought, they need to be in Mayport. Mayport is potentially a magical place. You two young ladies, I want you to remember what an old guy said years from now when you see what Mayport ends up being with both Chris Fisher and OSEARCH and other development that's going to go on there. And by the way, we saved the ferry, one of the few ferries left in the country, and we saved the ferry in conjunction with that. We've got a lighthouse that we'd like to move off the naval base to the, but that's another project. But OSEARCH is going to have an impact on Mayport and the surrounding area and the whole region like no one can ever anticipate, I think, right now. And I am so proud of these folks and of JU. JU's been a leader in this. And so it was a very simple thing. I got my council excited about it. We raised, you know, we paid, paid for the docks. We're working on commercial docks for the for the riverfront along along the river there we the city has seven under, seven acres of undeveloped property and i suspect there's going to be some housing some shops commercial fishing etc cetera, etc cetera, that will go well with osearch but um, i'm just i'm just happy to be part of it i really am i just think it's going to be a fantastic thing so with that the guy will tell you why it's going to really be fantastic yeah let me turn it over to chris and let him talk a little bit about the origin of OSEARCH and sort of where we are today and sort of where you see things going, particularly as it relates to Mayport. Hi, everybody. I'm Chris. Thanks for coming out. Um, I, well, this is a really, you know, this Mayport project is, is it's something that's, it's taking time to actually understand the impact on OSEARCH and on, on myself in particular. You know, I, I don't really tell this story often, but when I began the journey of OSEARCH in the late 90s, which started off in a different place with working in the Pacific and, and things like that and led into the, the shark work, when we were building that, I, I felt like at the time that it could become something that made a global impact. It could become something that was magical and was beyond any individual. And so it, even at those very early days, I, I had set an objective of a few things, you know, uh, 
just try to help you understand how we got here, you know, and, and Cousteau was my hero at the time. For any of you guys out there who know who Jacques Cousteau was, most people under the age of 45 don't know who he was. He was a global world ocean explorer. He poured the world's oceans into people's lives at a scale unseen before, which allowed people to connect to the ocean. And then in the late 90s, when I was going through this change and trying to see forward, I was spending a lot of time on the water off the Pacific coast of California. People were not that interested in what was going on in the ocean. It's not like it is now. It wasn't like it is now. No one, we were trying to talk about marine debris. We were trying to talk about all sorts of various issues that were affecting the ocean. But I think generally speaking, the mind of the globe was on a different place. And then people began working on it. And, and at that time, I was like, well, why is this happening? Why are people disconnected? Remember, I'm like, my mind right now is in 1997. And to me, it came down to, I was like, oh my gosh, Cousteau is gone. There was no one giving the ocean a global centrist voice. And people were disconnected from it, and that's why they didn't care. It wasn't that they didn't care, it's just that they were not aware of what was going on. Usually when people become aware of issues, then you get people working towards solutions, but there's a lack of awareness. And so to me at the time, it came down, it was like, ah, Cousteau is gone. And so I was like, and if we're gonna benchmark his life, if we're gonna try to do something great, like, like I was young and dumb at the time, and, and thank God for it, you know? So I set a few noble goals back in the day, and one of them was to pour the world's oceans into people's lives at or beyond the scale of Cousteau, which we've done now, but it's much easier now because there's um, more connectivity. You know, back then it was one day a week on four channels. Um, the other one was he led 22 expeditions. I was like, well, if we can hold it together and surpass that, then uh, maybe we can do something great and I'm happy to report we've completed over 40 expeditions now. But the third one was, I'm gonna try not to get too emotional here because this is a big moment in my life, what's happening here at Mayport with O-Search and Jacksonville University. The third one is, was not to make the same mistake he made because when he passed, there was no plan for it and the ocean lost its voice someone had to go through the same or similar journey to build an enterprise that could make that sort of impact. And if we were gonna pull that off, we had to build the enterprise with the disposition all along that we were gonna give it away. That we were gonna set it up when we could so that it had the capacity to transcend any individual's lifespan because it's too hard to get here. And the ocean needs a centrist global voice. And so, I mean, I know it sounds kind of weird we're here, but even back then, the mission was to try to build it so we could give it away, so that it could go on and on and on for all future generations to, to try to make sure that our kids can see an ocean full of fish and our ocean is working. And so for me, this is such a moment in my life journey to actually be placing O-Search at Jacksonville University in Mayport, setting it up so that it can transcend any individual's lifespan, setting it up so we can have all that institutional support to make it far bigger than we could have on our own as a small little agile nonprofit. So this is a huge moment. And when you look at like, when you try to look forward from, from here with that, you know, what is the vision for trying to make Mayport, Florida, the world-renowned research headquarters for this region of the world, right? We are aiming bigger and farther than the stars, right? You're talking about a woods hole, a small woods hole operation with world-class research, world-class rescue, world-class education, total inclusion with the community, right? One of O-Search's core values is inclusion. That's how we got here, by including everyone. And so this is a, an enormous moment. I think in the future you're going to see down here something that 
researchers are traveling from around the world to come here to get trained, and we'll have the facilities to do that. You'll see that the guys in the ship will be moving around the world so we can actually train people to do what we do in other parts of the world on a practical level, right? The fishermen, the water side, the power of O-Search is the world-class practical, the world-class waterman colliding with the world-class academic to collect the never-had-before data to manage so our kids can eat food and see an abundant ocean. So if you think of the ship around the world, the ambassador of this world headquarter here training the, the practical watermen how to handle these big animals while those scientists are here at Jacksonville in Mayport learning how to do all the work with the science team and now we are enabling people around the world to accelerate their data collection to move us toward abundance faster right this is a program with one simple rule anything's possible if you do not care who gets the credit so we are going to be sharing everything with everyone so we can all get there sooner. This is not about corner in the market to get ahead. This is about leading. This is about leading and giving and sharing and drawing the world toward abundance. And it is going to be rooted out of Mayport, Florida at Jacksonville University. And so it's an enormous moment for all of us, Captain Brett has been there with me since the beginning, Dr. Bob Huter, we have our fishing master here, we have our chief scientist here, we have Christian, and we have uh, all, several of the crew here, and, and it's an enormous moment for us all, because it's something, it has been a wild ride for 20 years to try to build an enterprise in a space doing something that no one's done outside of the system, so we can show there's a new way there's a way of all of us coming together. You know, in this particular journey, there is no you and me. There is just us. And what are we going to do to make sure when our kids are here 50 years from now, that water's teeming with life? And, and, and we're going to lead the way on that. And I'm hoping that it becomes a model for the world and that other cities are going to be calling Mayport and being like, how did you put this together? Can we build a station in South Africa? Can we build a station in northern Japan? Can we build a station in Chile and Argentina? There are nine white shark puzzles around the world that must be solved if our ocean is going to be full of fish. Nine white shark populations that don't mix. We have just solved the first one in history here off of your beaches. So we can now manage our white sharks, which moves our system toward abundance. We are winning here. We are the model for the world. This will be the model on help, how to help generate the data to get there. And we're hoping that we can take not only the field station and the collaborative model around the world by proving it here, but we can also take what we've done here to bring our ocean back over the last 30 years and share that with the policymakers in those regions so we can begin the journey to abundance in these other areas that are not in nearly as good a shape as we are. You should be celebrating. We're winning here. There's more fish here now than there's been since the 1940s. We are winning. Our children are going to see an ocean full of fish here. What we need to do is share with the rest of the world how we've done that so they can win for their kids too. And that's going to originate out of Mayport, Florida. Now do you understand why I was so inspired after hearing him that he o -Search needed to be in Mayport, Florida? I mean, that's, that's the kind of thing that really makes you feel that this is going to be a heck of an opportunity for the area, the region, and even the country. Everybody got their O-Search app? Huh? <laughs> you don't? You don't have it? Oh, my gosh. I can't, I can't so, believe you don't have it. You'll have uh, it by in the morning, won't you? Yeah. Okay, I just want to make sure. Osearch.com, it's out there. Yeah. Um, count, oh, dot org. Yeah, or, org. Org, sorry, dot, dot org, sorry. Um, Councilman Gulliver, talk a little bit about the history of Mayport oh, yeah. and why something like Osearch at Mayport is needed. Okay. Mayport, for those of you who may not be aware, is actually older than St. Augustine. They just, they just hired better PR people than Mayport did. And uh, we were 1562, and, and they were 1565. And some of you, I know, know the history of the French Huguenots first settling there and the Spaniards ending up wiping them out. But Mayport evolved into a, 
a marine area, a maritime area. Commercial fishing over the years was very, very strong out of there. And, uh, and there's a tremendous amount of history in the Mayport area. Unfortunately, when the Navy came along in the 40s and, and built a naval base there, they encroached on some parts of Mayport where some of that history is, including the lighthouse. Uh, but as I said earlier, we hope that in the future we'll be able to move the lighthouse into an open place where people can see it. But this just really fits with the history of Mayport, especially when you look at all the marine and maritime history out of the Mayport area for centuries, really. And, uh, and I think you will see a return to commercial fishing. I don't know how many of you are aware, but Unfortunately, that seven acres of undeveloped waterfront was bought by Jacksport to put a cruise terminal there, and it was a really dumb idea, but it languished empty for about 10, 11, 12 years, and then finally we were able to get this, them to transfer the ownership to the city of Jacksonville. So it's, it's a wide open opportunity, not only for O-Search, but the village as, as a whole, and I think you all will be proud in the future of what you see there. Chris, can you talk a little bit about what your vision for the actual facility at Mayport may look like? And what, you, what we, I'll say, we have envisioned we'll actually build down there? Yeah, I mean, there's a, we're going through a process of, like, what do we want to see down at Mayport? Well, we know we need some sort of a residence or some, uh, a crew house, a house for the guys. My guys have been traveling around the world on a boat for 20 years. You know, so when, when we're tied up at the dock, I would, they're going to, we're going to put them in a house. And so a small house for them. Uh, you're going to see a, kind of a boat barn, for lack of a better word, where there's a full shop for all the repairs and work. A research center. I think Dr. Franks has mentioned he would like to have a wet lab there, you know, so when you come into the education center, you're learning all about sharks, a lot of visual interactive. You're looking through glass. You're seeing scientists working in a wet lab. There's educational room in there, a lot of students flowing through. There's a, there's a place for these visiting scientists to come and stay. You know, right now, OSEARCH on our current team, we're supporting 12 different research institutions just in Florida. There's a total of 25 different institutions on the white shark team now, ranging from Nova Scotia down over into the Gulf of Mexico. But 12 of those are from Florida. So other universities are going to have the opportunities to send their students to come up, stay, get some ship time, right? What we really see in this space is that a lot of the people going through the marine biology program or these other programs to become researchers, they don't get enough practical experience. They don't get enough touches. It's too much book time and not enough sea time. So what we're trying to do is be able to facilitate more sea time for these kids that are coming up through the system so that they're not only good scientists when they get out on the water, they have the practical experience to conduct the work. Maybe they're a little bit handy with a boat too, like they can tie a knot or drive a small boat so that if they have to do it on their own, we can help them get out on their own. So I think you'll see a lot of visiting scientists uh, both coming through for that sort of experience and local work here. Uh, and then you'll see some of the people coming from around the world that are coming maybe when we're doing a little bit more training on the larger sharks because all winter long, we have access here to great white sharks. And, and these scientists, for them to get their hands on them, it almost never happens. It, it basically never happens unless you're standing aboard the O-Search. You might see one come by and poke at it. But we need to get these kids more time touching. So I think you're going to see a welcome center with a great interactive thing that people can come through and learn all about sharks in an hour or so with some merch and sort of things for people to, to buy and enjoy with a big educational component, an operating wet lab, a home for the guys, and then a boathouse for, you know, all of the work and repair and the shop work that needs to be done. And I think, and then, and then I'm a, You'll know this about me. I, I'm, I'm kind of crazed about just having beautiful grounds. Just a pretty, like it should be a place when you come to visit, you're learning, and it's beautiful, and it's relaxing. And I think beautiful grounds adds to that kind of calm and relaxing thing. So I'm hoping that it's stunningly gorgeous with all the beautiful flora and fauna of Florida you know, in a very educational, inclusive place. 
one of the things we've sort of discovered as we get out there is almost every time we go out there, we have different ideas. Um, I'm not sure we can cram everything into the site that we're actually thinking about sometimes. They'll um, give us more land. Yeah. Well, there's only with so much land down there. That's, that's part of the issue. Um, and we can't go but so high because of the Navy and, and flying, which is sort of interesting. Um, what's has happened in Mayport over the la last years is you saw uh, a demise of the area um, because the shrimping fleet left and, and the shrimping went away to some extent. And whether we can bring that back, we're going to work on that. There is a group um, that works down there. It's called the Mayfort Waterfront Partnership. Um, Councilman Gullifer, can you talk a little bit about that partnership and how it came about and what its vision for Mayport is? It, uh, the Mayport Waterfront Partnership started in the 1990s, late 1990s. It was designated, the state came up with a program, it was designated as a working waterfront. And, and that was its goal when it was established to create a working waterfront uh, for Mayport. And there had been, been a number of impediments, including Jacksport buying up the property uh, uh, for cruise terminal. But I think finally we're to the point that we have, have uh, the city involved in funding commercial docks along the river and we've engaged Haskell Company to develop a plan, a development plan for the remaining part that OSEARCH uh, doesn't use. So I think it will be attractive for a number of reasons, um, including obviously the biggest one being OSEARCH. One of the other things I mentioned, Dr. White mentioned history, where there is a desire and a plan in, in the future to, to, to come up with a museum of some, a maritime museum to, uh, to add to the theme or the idea of what, what has gone on in Mayport for, for many years. And so I think, um, as I told, as I told Dr. Fisher, or, or Chris Fisher, that's Dr. Chris Fisher, as I told Chris Fisher, I said, you'll know when you're successful and the residents start complaining about you because there's the traffic and the parking. That always happens, you know, when you're really successful. But I think Mayport is going to draw an awful lot of people uh, with, with O-Search, and I think it's going to be fantastic. Let me give you a plug. Um, there is a wonderful two-story community center that's been built there. By the way, it's right across from the boat ramp. For those of you that know that that's the most, that's the busiest boat ramp in all of Jacksonville, but right across from the boat ramp, there's a two-story building that you can rent for a, a, a party, a get together, whatever you want to do for four hours for 200 and some dollars. It's got a kitchen, got bathrooms, hold a hundred and so people. So y'all, if you've got some event going on, you ought to take advantage of it. Yeah, I saw the comment. In fact, I was going to mention that um, the, the community center is actually named for Bill Gulliford, which is uh, we're sort of excited That's not about. important. But I was going to point out that it's modeled after a hotel that used to be in Mayport. And one of the things that the citizens of Mayport want is for any buildings to have that Mayport character and that Mayport feel. And we've been talking to architects already about how we can do that, how we can incorporate it. We need to sort of blend Chris Fisher's modern research vision with the Mayport traditional fishing vision. And what's interesting is the architects get excited about that idea, about how they can do it. Um, and so we've had a lot of ideas about how we'll do things. Um, one of the things we're going to have to contend with is sea level rise. It's happening. It's real. And so we're going to have to cope with that, which probably means a two-story structure, just like the community center is, and get it high enough. Um, it's got, I discovered recently it's got to be nine feet above sea level in order to meet the code. So it's going to be sitting up there a little bit, and so we're going to have some interesting challenges. But we, the OSEARCH team has been working on the design concepts, what they want in the facility, um, and so when we get to the point that we can hire an architectural and construction firm, um, they will be taking those ideas, and then they'll work with us to sort of put that all together. So. It's an exciting idea. Uh, we've thought about having shark tanks out there, and you can have a water flow system. Um, I'm actually in the process of retiring from JU as the director of the Marine Science Research Institute, and Dr. Brian Franks is beginning to take over. And so we're sort of watching this transition happen, which is really exciting. Um, but with that, let me just sort of open up. We're, we're about 15 minutes left, I think. So we'll get uh, Lucas to get a mic that we can pass around. but. Does anybody um, have any questions for anybody on the panel at this stage of the game?
about how many great whites are usually off the coast of our beaches in the winter. I mean, so, I swim. Yeah, so the way the white sharks are moving up and down the East Coast is right here, we're kind of in the heart of the winter range of the white shark. The primary winter range of the white shark stretches from Cape Hatteras, North Carolina, down to Cape Canaveral, Florida. And what you have happening there is the Gulf Stream wraps around the Keys and starts coming up southeastern Florida, and then it kicks off of Cape Canaveral. It kicks up and out to the northeast, and then eventually wanders back in up at Cape Hatteras. And what that Gulf Stream does when it does that is it pins a cold body of water against the beach between the coast and the inner edge of the Gulf Stream. That cold strip of water is the primary winter range of the white sharks. All of the white sharks that go up to the north to feed all summer and fall, whether they're going to Newfoundland or Nova Scotia or Maine or Massachusetts, they all are spread out up there. They're going back to the same areas to feed every summer and fall. They feed, they'll put a lot of pressure on the seals and they bulk up for the winter, right? Then they slide down into this area between Hatteras and Canaveral for the bulk of the winter. We see about 50% of the sharks slip south of Canaveral and they go on walkabout over into the Gulf for about three months and then they come back right back into the primary winter range and hang out again. Um, but about half of them do make it over into the Gulf. So the entire population of white sharks in the western North Atlantic is between Hatteras and, you know, south and through here all winter long. So this time of year, that entire population has now moved north. The juvenile, the really young, young of the year sharks and two-year-old sharks will be on the south shore of New York's Long Island right there in the New York, New Jersey bite. That's the birthing area. That's the primary nursery where they spend their first summer and fall. And then they move down to the Carolinas, off the Carolina coast, the lower outer banks for the winter in their first winter. And then they begin to expand that range. By the time they're four, they're ranging all the way from Newfoundland down around the Keys. And uh, as far west, we've had one shark go all the way to Cancun. For the most part, though, they don't go too much west of the Mississippi River. Um, so you got the whole population of white sharks here in the winter. So the question is, uh, how many is that? And so I would say it's many, many, many times more than what the current science suggests it is. Are you at, you know, is the question how many giant great white sharks there are? Or how many white sharks there are, including all the babies? Right, the little four and a half to six footers, seven footers, eight footers. Uh, numbers are, when we beat this work, the, the population of white sharks really bottomed out here at about 9% of what it should have been in the early 90s, early 2000s, and we've turned the tide on that, and I'd say we're probably creeping up into the high teens with good trajectory to, for a nice steady recovery. The reason why it takes so long is because these animals aren't sexually mature till they're 20. They can't have babies till they're 20 years old. And then the females only give birth every other year because their gestation period is longer than one year. So when you're looking at a, a species that can't begin to reproduce until they're 20, and then the females only give birth every other year to you know eight to 10 pups, there's no big steep curve, right? But we started looking after them about 35 years ago. So it was 90, right? Yeah, about 35 years ago. So we do know how, we do, knew the, we do now have those first few classes of baby white sharks from 1993 and 1992 that are just now becoming sexually mature and able to have babies. But the great thing about that is, is now every single year, there's another big class that's been coming out from the protected years, beginning when all the gill nets were removed and the baby white shark stopped being wiped out. So uh, the numbers are going up. The more white sharks you see, the more fish you'll see. So when you go out, you're, you're going to see a changing ocean. This is turning back into one of the great wild oceans again. So if you talk to Captain Brett, if you have time to chat with him, we've had the great privilege of working in some of the most virgin seas around the world, whether it's the Galapagos or Cocos or the Revilla Hijedos or the Great Barrier Reef, Ningaloo. We've been to a lot of them. 
when you're at those places, you know, they're so wild that, you know, um, when you catch anything, you got to handle it quick or you're going to get sharked. Uh, and it's just teeming with life, which means all the birds are back, everything's back. We're, we're moving toward where the challenge for fishermen here will be in the future will not be to locate fish to get a bite like it has been in the past, but it will be, I don't have to go as far. It's teeming with life, but what's my strategy for learning how to fish in a wild, abundant ocean versus learning how to fish in a highly compromised ocean, which is what everyone who grew up fishing here in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, you were fishing in a highly compromised ocean. So you could fish light tackle and play a fish for 30 minutes and catch it. You can't do that in a wild ocean. When you catch a fish in the Galapagos Islands, if you don't bear down on that thing right away, you're, they're all over you. Or the, or the Galapagos or Ningaloo or anywhere else. That's what a wild ocean looks like. And we're on our way back to a wild ocean. It's an incredible gift we're going to give to our children. And this region of the world is the leader. And it's because your white sharks are here. If they're here in numbers, that they are the balance keeper. That means the system is balanced, operating, and thriving. They are the canary in the coal mine. When they disappear, you got big problems. When they're thriving, it's time to celebrate. But what it does is it shifts the test on the ocean. It shifts the test of the angler. Are you only able to catch them the way you always used to? Or are you creative enough, agile enough, and smart enough to figure out how to catch in a wild system versus a compromised system, which is much harder to get the bite, right? You got to find the fish to get the bite. But then once you get the bite, you know, nothing messes with, with, with what you're dealing with. This is now going to shift to, I can get a bite a quarter mile off the beach. It's wide open. Uh, but I, I'm having to deal with a different challenge. I think that's what you're going to see here uh, in the future, which is just, uh, it's going to be amazing because in one of the most populated coasts in the world, we're going to have oceans that are as wild as some of the most remote places in the world. Yeah, people sort of forget sometimes. I get complaints from fishermen who go in and out of Mayport um, that there are too many sharks. And what's happened is because the sharks are the top-level predator, much like and we've used the analogy of the wolves in Yellowstone, um, they drive the entire ecosystem. And so when you have more sharks, it means there's more fish. And so it's more sharks is a good thing, not a bad thing. And when people start talking about trying to do away with sharks, that's the wrong direction. Well, to, and I think what people, there's more fish because there's more sharks. Exactly, exactly. Right? Yeah. It, it, there's can't not have the more sharks because there's more fish. Yeah, you can't have more top-level predators. There's something to feed the, the pyramid up and up through it. Uh, one of the things I think that's been happening, and it's going to be fascinating to watch this over the next few years, um, the technology that we have on our phones is amazing. And when you can download Shark Tracker and where, see where the sharks are and what's going on and what's happening, um, it sort of gives you a little glimpse of what's going to happen. I tell my students right now, when I look at the changes that's happened in um, research over my career and then think about what's going to happen in the next 40 years, it's going to be amazing. In fact, one of the challenges I think we're going to have as we design our Mayport headquarters is how do we make sure that that building is adaptable? Um, one of the things when we built the MSRI we did, we tried to build in adaptations to things. We tried to build in enough things. Um, I cannot tell you how much electricity I put into that building, and it's now not enough. <laughs> and that's only 12 years later. So we're going to have some challenges to try to make sure that things are, uh, that we can remain, remain on the cutting edge. We're there now, and we want to stay that way. Um, and so we're sort of excited. Other questions? Hello? Uh, a little while ago, we did some uh, work with the uh, Coral Reef Foundation down in uh, Key Largo. And one of the things we saw was a lot of bleaching of the coral beds. And it was, it was void of life. I mean, there was no fish. And of course, what they're doing is, you know, they're trying to grow new coral beds and all that. Does that impact the great whites as well when you have these vast areas that have virtually no fish at all? I think that you'll see as the sharks return to abundance, I think you'll see that those reefs will begin to, to heal and the fish will be able to, I think that it'll all positively move in the right direction. Look, these animals are super adaptable. They move about 100 miles to 150 miles a day, just like you and I walking around town. 
So, no, they would just bounce into the area of life. They probably wouldn't find themselves there too frequently unless they were just on a migration, right? Because they're moving from event to event to event. These white sharks that are out here, they know where they are, and they know where they're going, and they know what the date is. Their lives are very, very tied into the moon. We see sharks on the same spot on the same moon year over year because then you look into it, well, there's a red drum event there or a black drum event or some sort of menhaden event. So these sharks know all of these events when animals are coming together to spawn or coming together to feed on something else, and they, it's hardwired in their minds, and they're moving from event to event to event on the same day, on the same schedule year-round. And so if there's no events going on there, you won't find them there. Um, you'll probably find them over on the, what do they call that, the humps, the, you know, the mounds that are off of uh, the keys there where they go to catch tuna. You know, those places are thriving with life, right? So they've got the inshore, you got the outshore, they got different opportunities. And one of the unique things about our white sharks here is our population of white sharks is both coastal and pelagic. They have a pelagic component to their life, which is this big offshore component with these big movements. But they're also coastal where they'll come in and lit, um, work on all these different events, fish events and bait events, stick their noses in these rivers. You'll see them come in, you know, when you get a cold snap here and it pushes all the porpoise out of uh, the river? They're outside the river waiting to whack them when they come out, right? So they understand all that. They are, um, they are the top predator in the ocean. You got to think about them like a lion. You know, they can get whatever they want, whenever they want, and go wherever they want, whenever they want. So uh, that is an issue we need to deal with, with water quality and various other issues. Uh, but I don't think that that's going to really have a big impact on the white shark's life. They're just far more versatile than a, a, having a one-trick kind of program. I'll also comment that one of the things that happens is with Shark Tracker, we've been able to track these sharks when they move. And we also, the males and females move differently uh, with a reproductive pattern. Councilman Gulliver. Well, I just wanted to remind everybody about this application. And based on what y'all are hearing now, you might want to get this application on your phone and check it before you go in the water, you know? You don't need to worry about that, right? The one thing we have learned is all of So he's talking, there's a free O search app if you want to track the sharks in real time. Um, you know, nothing's changed. We just know now. I remember when we tagged the very first two sharks. The first shark was named Jeannie. We named after Jeannie Clark, one of the founders of Moat Marine Lab. And the second one was named Mary Lee. I named that shark after my mom. I thought that that was going to be the last shark O-Search ever touched. That's why I named it after my mom. I thought O-Search was over. Um, but, but it wasn't. And um, Mary Lee came here. When we tagged Mary Lee in the fall of 2012, she proceeded to come right down here to the uh, Jacksonville Beach Pier. And the strangest phone call, I think Mary Lee knew we were all going to be yeah. together way before we did. Yeah, probably. And I called Jacksonville Beach Police Department. It was, I was in a blizzard out west, and it was late. And I'm like, I don't know who to call, but I got a 4,000-pound white shark underneath the pier. And I think people are going to start surfing in a couple hours. And I showed it to the, uh, to the, the, the officers, and they looked at it. And they came down here, and they... they they closed down the beach for a little bit, and then Mary Lee pinged in like three and a half miles off the beach an hour and a half later, and they reopened it up. And that was a pivotal moment in O-Search and its future. And, uh, but when, when I made that call, just to show you how much we've learned, at that time, they said, there's no white sharks in Florida. In 2012, there's no, we don't, we don't have white sharks down here. I'm like, well, I got one, you know, and it's there, you know. And now we know it's the winter range of the white sharks. So think about how much we've uncovered. We now know where they're giving birth. We understand their nursery, how they're moving around. We know what they're eating. We know what kind of bacteria is in their mouth. So if someone gets bit, we can tell the hospital what antibiotic to use to stop the infection instead of having them guess and get it wrong and let the infection get out of control. So there's all sorts of human health things going on as well. Um, now I forgot the question, but yeah, well, uh, Mary, the, but we've learned, they said there was no white sharks here, yeah. you know, and so we've learned so much so fast, and now it's nothing's changed. They were always here, we just know now. Yeah. So I think it's good to stay on track of what's going on. But the most important thing is when you go down to the beach, and many of you all know this, Florida people are so connected to the water. It's very different when you go up in the Northeast. Uh, 
is that, you know, if you see a bunch of birds crashing on bait and game fish crashing, that's not the spot to jump in the water, right? You're looking for a nice, quiet spot, and then you jump in. But if the bait's there and the game fish are crashing and the birds are diving, you don't want to swim out into the middle of the food chain, right? If you were seeing a lion stalking a few deer, you wouldn't go over and go walk out and hang out with the deer, right? So it's going to be down to us to be a little bit smarter. Florida people are. You know, look at the water, swim in the nice quiet spots, and when it's going off and there's a lot of life, sit back and enjoy it, and enjoy it because it's going to be the future. It's going to be the Florida safari, the Florida ocean safari. And it's coming, and it's exciting. Yeah, yeah if you want to, before you go in the water, if you'll stick your finger in it and taste it, if it tastes salty, there's sharks there. <laughs> One, one last thing. I didn't mention, uh, there's a facility in Mayport. I don't know if you young ladies went through the Duval County school system or not, but it's called the Marine Science Center. And every kid in the, in the school system goes out there for one day to experience the ocean, the beach. They've got tanks in there where they can see fish. And, and, and you know, for kids, it's really exciting. Can you imagine the impact of having their facility in Mayport and coordinating with the Duval County school system. I mean, that is a great thing for kids. And yeah. I, I really look forward to hearing about that. Yeah, and we've already talked to them about having a coordinated program. We have groups kind of doing the same thing. Maybe time for one more question. We've got one last question real quick. A rapid. We're coming up on our, our five o'clock shutdown, so. Can, can you try to real quick um, expand on what you were saying about how apex predators are so important, how the sharks themselves are causing more fish to be present. Yes. So this is, I think, the biggest misconception about sharks. Sharks are actually the guardians of our fish stocks, and people think, like, sharks eat fish. What sharks do, the most important role for a white shark or any of these large sharks, is just being present, being the apex predator. Think about a lion moving through the forest. Everything knows that lion is moving through the forest and it is modifying their behavior. The squirrels go quiet, the elk bed down, the deer hide, the coyotes run off, everything. And so what that, when it affects that behavior of all of those animals, it affects those animals' impact on the environment. So this will make more sense. But that's the big picture idea. The white sharks, when they move up north, right now they're up north off the beaches. We know that one white shark swimming up and down a beach can keep a thousand seals stuck on the beach because they're terrified they might get taken. We know when that white shark is not there, every one of those seals goes in the water and eats four times more per day because the white shark is not there. And they wipe out the cod and the stripers and the lobster and the menhaden and there's nothing left for us. They overgraze. So just the mere presence of the white sharks swimming up and down the beaches, they are guarding the fish stocks of our entire northeastern striper, cod, uh, mackerel, lobster fisheries, all that stuff, because otherwise, because the, the seals are coming. The seals, I don't know if you've, the seals, do you know, our seal recovery is in full swing. The Marine Mammal Protection Act was passed 50 years ago, and there were almost no seals left. When we started our work in uh, 2012 up in Cape Cod, there were a handful full of seals on the beach now. Now there's like 100,000 seals and the seal population is stretching all the way down to the Jersey Shore. That seal population will reestablish itself all the way down to North Carolina. If we don't have a healthy white shark population, your mid-Atlantic redfish is wiped out. <laughs> The men hate and are gone, all the bait fish that everything eats. So it's really about, yes, they eat some of the next thing, but the real thing is, is they modify the behavior of everything just by cruising around. Real quickly, down here, when the white sharks are down here, they're putting a lot of pressure on your squid. So every night when the squid migrate to the surface, they stay down a little bit because the sharks are putting a lot of pressure on them, just their presence, because they like to eat squid. When those sharks aren't gone, those squid come up right to the surface and they wipe out all our fry. They eat all the baby marlin, all the baby tuna, all the baby tarpon, all the baby snapper. There's no place to hide out there. So if the white sharks aren't keeping them down, the squid are coming up and they wipe out our fry and then there's no fish for us to eat. So that's why they're so important. Their numbers is just to be present, 
right? And so because those white sharks are putting pressure on, remember what we said earlier, because of the sharks, there are more fish, not because of the fish, there are more sharks. Because those white sharks are putting the pressure on the seals, there's more fish. Because the sharks are down here putting the pressure on the squid, the fry are succeeding and there are more fish. So while people are getting sharked and you are seeing more sharked, there is more of everything. In fact, there's far more additional fish and everything else than there are of the sharks, but it's all connected. Yeah, it's a balancing act between birth, death, and what's being eaten. And so when you lose your top level predator, it means that the next level expands, which means they eat more of the next level, which means that they go away, which means the next level expands, which eats more of the next level. And eventually the whole thing collapses, which is what happened, for instance, out on the West Coast when they get away with the sea otters eating the urchins and that whole system collapsed. The same thing happens in Yellowstone with the wolves, in the safari, in, our, in Africa, et cetera. I think we're out of time. In fact, we've been a little bit over time. So thank you all. Been thank a great you all audience. very much. Thank our panel. And come see us sometime. Guys, once again, give them a big round of applause.